one one of the first things you need to understand anytime you're dealing with an addictive disorder the primary symptom is blindness and denial the way you know you you're an addict is because you don't know you're an addict and it's really a catch-22 that's why it kills you 96 percent of the time and only one out of 10 people ever do anything to get help for because by the time you see it you're really in a world of hurt it takes a lot because we're really good at protecting ourselves and i'm going to talk about that today too and the good news and the bad news is we're good at that when it comes to addiction that starts to work against us so hopefully you'll have a better understanding of that and this is part one next week i'm going to look at what I call the sociology of addiction, the culture and the people around us and how they promote on the one hand and then, and then criminalize and enable it on the other. And that reinforces a blindness and denial too. And I might get frustrated with that. That makes me mad sometimes because it's un it hurts a lot of people. So anyway, today we're just going to talk about how, it, how we kind of get into it and those type things. And then we'll pick it up with part two tomorrow, next week. And if you have questions, don't be afraid. And uh, so this, we're getting into the good stuff now. And then after that, we're going to get into looking at families and kids and, and, and how we all get hurt by it. So anyway, part one. Why can't we see what's happening to us? I call it the ism. If you look at <coughs> alcohol is the only addiction that they use the ism with, but there's an ism component to all addictions. And if you have alcoholism and you get rid of the alcohol, then you still got the ism to deal with. And to some extent, that's more formidable than the alcohol. And sometimes we grow up in families. I grew up in a family, I always said, I grew up in a family with no alcohol, but a lot of alcoholism. And that's not necessarily the same thing. And it's, it was more confusing as a result of that. I saw the behavior and, and the effects, but there wasn't any way to make sense out of it. My mom was especially crazy that way, but she was, grew up in a family where she was abandoned and, ruined and wounded and did the best she could, but you just can't do what you can't do. And when you're a little kid trying to make sense out of that, you have to get kind of crazy sometimes to do that. And so, and I, I still have, I can still be pretty crazy, but that's, that's a different issue. We won't go there. All right, let's see if we can figure out what I'm talking about when I talk about the ism. Okay, well, now let me ask you a question. What do you think of when you think of a practicing addict or alcoholic? Just some terms. What do you think of? No right answers, okay? Yes. Huh? No. Pain. Pain. All right. Deception. Substance. What do you mean, Deception. substance? Deception. Deception. Deception, okay. Would lying mm -hmm. be another way? All right. Anybody else? Depressed. Depressed. When you say depressed, what do you mean? Bummed out all the time? Or? Yeah, bummed out. You know, just like light and darkness. Oh, know, okay, you know. all right. So they're kind of down in a dark yeah, place yeah. most of the time. All right. Anybody else? Numbing. Numbing. So they don't, they just zombie land kind of stuff. Is that what you mean? Oh, maybe not even that part. All right, probably but. Probably the pain. All right, well, yeah. But, so when you think about them you think about the pain and how they have what they have to do to numb it and what is that what do they do to numb it um drink <laughs> self-medicate they self they medicate yeah i think of anger think of anger so they can be pretty angry and and when you think of anger <laughs> on a scale of one to ten where would you put that anger <laughs> All right, so, well, now I, th you t I think you're talking about rage when you get yeah. to that point, okay. So you think of a pretty rageful, very angry, can I, big dicky, would that be a good word? Yeah, yeah, and, right. and I guess in my experience I've seen it two different ways. I've seen 
the <coughs> alcohol be part of bringing the rage on or the alcohol actually making the person pleasant to be with because they were mm-hmm. really angry prior to drinking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. sure, okay, side. yeah. Well, when you start drinking, the anger still there, just don't bother you as much yeah. now. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Well, sometimes, it gets sometimes it's like putting gas on a fire. Yeah. So you never know what you're going to be dealing yeah. with. That's, that's true. Anybody else? Control and manipulation. Okay, so can you explain that a little bit more? <laughs> um, just uh, they they try to find ways to use you and uh, to kind of support mm-hmm. getting what they want out of you. So they're still trying to get over. Is what the old term used to be, and get their needs met. That's a form, I think, of dishonesty and. And manipulation can be a way to scam you, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Kind of like a blame game. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm-hmm. What do you mean a blame game? Well, they they blame everybody mm-hmm. else but not themselves. Well, they don't sure. see themselves. Yeah. So everybody else, if it wasn't for that, mm-hmm. I'd be okay. Okay, sure. And uh, probably to make an excuse for what they're doing. Okay, so they have to justify their behavior mm-hmm. all the time. Okay, so, uh, so what you described is somebody that wouldn't be a very nice person. Doesn't sound like to me. Okay, let's see. What do we got here? So this is kind of what you see is that addict self, kind of insensitive, intrusive, obnoxious, uncaring, lackadaisical, irresponsible. A lot of times they can't keep jobs. I've been through a lot of jobs. Some of them worth keeping, some not, but it didn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't look like their values or they don't have a lot of expectations of themselves. Not very competitive, often look come across incompetent. They're ambivalent, defiant. They don't care about what other people need or their opinions. That's how they look. Anything else up there that I should have put in? And that don't sound like a very nice person to me either. But go ahead, what's next? Okay, this is, but this is his vulnerability. This is what the, who the addict really is. This is their true self. Hypersensitive, perfectionistic. Do you know most alcoholics fall, fall in a 90 percentile perfectionism? Mm. Do you know what IQs are typically? Well, they're, they're, it depends on the person. Usually they're probably average or above average. They tend to be um, higher than other people, I think. They're hyper-caring, have very high values and self-expectations. They're highly competitive, very concerned about pleasing and placating other people, very concerned about what other people think of them, have a very high work ethic. How many of you think of an addict or an alcoholic like that? Any anybody? Well, yeah, because when you started talking, I, I have a an alcoholic in my life that I love dearly, and mm-hmm. he's actually didn't jump around a lot of jobs, and he was very proficient in his career. And of course, he's very a very caring person. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'd say hypersensitive, <laughs> but mm-hmm. caring, incompetent, and. Mm-hmm. Well, I think for the addict, sensitivity is a liability. I think they are very sensitive, but it's a liability, so they have to cover it up, and, and a lot of the reaction you see is, is to protect themselves because they are so sensitive. And so what you see in recovery are these things more so. And, you know, and being like this when you have an addiction is a real liability because our outside really in conflict or contrary to this. That's a, it's like having a civil war going on inside. My true self and my addict self. And there's always this conflict. The term is characterological conflict. That means that my values and, and morals are in conflict with my behavior. And those, that conflict creates a lot of emotional pain. 
and like I was saying to Carolyn, that will mimic most psychiatric symptoms and issues. So addicts routinely get misdiagnosed with mental health issues, but it's really more a function of this characterological conflict. And you can medicate this guy up to yin-yang, yin yang, but until he does some self-reconciliation work, those symptoms aren't going to change. And it creates tremendous emotional pain, anxiety, and stress. And how does the addict deal with that pain? Uses more substances. Medicates or distracts if you're a gambler or a process addiction. Okay. And so then that just creates more pain. And then what do you do to deal with the pain? That's a heck of a heck of a situation. Talk about a no win. That's where you're at. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. And so that's, that's the dilemma. I can't not do it and be okay, and I can't do it and be okay. And that'll make you crazy on a good day. So let's move it up. I was just going to say Go ahead. That, um, All right, go ahead. The addict's behavior, um, the last statement there, I've also um, seen that not only in the addict's behavior, but the way... Um, the system medicates mm -hmm. the way doctors will prescribe. Well, sure. Because, because they, this, they misdiagnose, but go have, ahead. You have this anxiety, so now we need to give you something mm -hmm. to deal yeah. with the anxiety so you can overcome the addiction. Yeah. The, most common, uh, the most common diagnosis for alcoholics is depression or anxiety. And more and more, well, let's think about it. Depression, to me, if you look at deep limbic effects of grief, and we're going to get to that, it, it has the same effects as clinical depression. And what is anxiety? It's fear. Mm -hmm. But it's different from fear. Fear says, I'm afraid, and I know why. Anxiety says, I'm afraid, and I don't know why. And that fear of the unknown, I think, is a lot more difficult to deal with. And for the addict, it's highly inflated. And so if I come in, you know, and if I was this person, when I see the clients I would see, they would come in and I would, I would redefine the depression around grief and loss. That comes with a deal. And help them start to identify the, uh, the unknown so they could start to deal with the anxiety and it, it just worked better. Because, you know, and I used to say to them, I'd be worried about you if you weren't depressed and anxious. That'd be pretty crazy. So let's start to see if we can figure out where that's coming from and help you grieve and help you find out what you're afraid of so then you won't have to be so crazy to make sense out of it. And then you don't have to medicate it or distract from it. And so I've found that a lot more helpful. Unfortunately, most professionals, and I'm speaking from being one of them, and most physicians and psychiatrists and psychologists don't understand this. I'm going to get on my soapbox here. They get what I call checklist or uh, 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 checklist medicine or symptom symptomism. And they just look at the symptom and check it off. You got this, 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 and this. You're this, so take this pill, you know, and that's how they've been trained. You know, I'm not putting them down. It's just they don't know any better. But I think when it comes to addiction, it doesn't work so good. In fact, it, it makes a problem worse, and it, and it reinforces the addict thinking. Well, I'm not really an addict. I just, I'm just depressed or anxious. You know, I got to do straighten that out, and that, I think, becomes part of the problem at that point. Right, let me show you how this works. I've got an addict. We're going to call him Al. All right. Keep going. <coughs> now, this is the ism. We've got Al or Alice. And, no, and you got on the outside is the reality. And on the inside is the addict. Remember what a hypersensitive caring person he is. But his reality doesn't work that way. For, say, let's say Al goes out to a party and he has a few drinks and he gets drunk and he gets sloppy and he falls down and he trips over a lamp and breaks it and he gets 
sick and he pukes on the carpet or the sofa. Somebody comes up and says, Al, you okay? And Al wants to go upside his head. You know, you know the fighting drunks. I was a fighting drunk. You can tell them they're the new men with the new teeth. <laughs> Got the best teeth money can buy, <laughs> okay? But, but uh, you see, that ain't what he's about. And Al cares about his social relationship and people. And so that experience is going to threaten him. And so what, are pe what do you do when you feel threatened? I'm not talking way out here. A normal person, what do you do when you feel threatened? Well, you either become big or you become small. So you okay. Protect you, you, you protect yourself. You defend yourself. And if it's a physical threat, you defend yourself physically by fighting back or running or carrying a weapon. But this situation is threatening you in a more significant way, emotionally and spiritually. So you, that's what our psychological defenses are for, to protect us that way. Without them, we wouldn't survive. And so that threatens Al. And he builds this wall using his defenses, like I just pointed out, between himself and that social problem. But he also keeps him from seeing the social problem as a problem. The reason it happened was because of all this stuff. And besides, the reason I got sick was all that chip and dip, you know. I did that one night, and I decided next time, no more chip and dip. That damn stuff make you sick, you know. <laughs> Didn't have anything to do with the fifth I washed it down with, you know. But that was, that's, that's how I make sense out of it. And sooner or later, Al's going to be at a party. He's going to try to get home. And between the party and home, he's going to run up against one of the state's finest. And they're going to pull him over and maybe ends up with an OWI or they get him for disorderly by fighting in public or something like that. I never did that, but I knew a guy like that. Huh? But anyway, and so Al, most addicts are very conservative and they're law abiding and they respect the law. So what's that going to do to who he is? Here again, it's going to threaten that part of him about who he is. So what's he going to do to make sense out of it? Going to break out those defenses. Here again, that's automatic. And when I was working with drunk drivers and IDP program, you, you know, they would, that's what they would come in already set up. I had a guy tell me one night, he said, well, I was driving okay. I said, how do you know? He said, my buddy told me so. <laughs> I said, was well, your buddy drinking? The guy said, oh, hell yeah, he drank more than I did. <laughs> or I was driving down the wrong and load, and there's this dog in the middle of the road, or there's this road in the middle of the road, and I swerved to miss it. Sucker's right there and got me, you know, or went to get out the car and trip and fell on the cop. I said, yeah, that tips him off when you can't even walk. All right, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he stopped me because I had a tail light out. I was driving along and. Uh, and reached over to tune the radio and or pull out a cigarette and I just swerved a little bit and he was right there. This is something you guys may or may not know. Guy told me this, so you know it's true. He said, you know, Claire's got more cops than the city of Chicago. <laughs> and that's it, you know. <laughs> They're just out there waiting for you, you know. <laughs> and my and my car is always the last one on the parking lot, so they're out there to get you, you know. And when I start thinking like that, what happens to that legal problem in my sense of culpability? It's not there. There are all these other reasons why it happened. But I never connect my addictive behavior to that problem. So it keeps going. And then at some point along the way, it's going to cause some problems. You know, if, when you show up drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning, tripping all over the place, it's something about spouses don't appreciate that. They don't pat you on the back for that stuff. I never understood that. But you see, that's a problem. She just, just don't understand, you know, and she's uh, and she just never always looking for a problem anyway. So that's the reason. Hell, she's always complaining. No matter what you do, she's going to complain. What the hell? Had a wife like mine, you'd drink too. <laughs> or a husband or whichever one, right? Yeah. See? I'm just repeating what I've heard, all right? <laughs> there you go. Or any damn kids, hell, you can't please them. They're always wanting this or that or the other, and they're going to complain no matter what. So, hell, I might as well go on out and get drunk or, or get, take a couple hits. What the heck? Don't make no difference. She's going to find a reason to have a problem anyway. 
and somewhere along the way you're going to start having some medical problems. You know what that is? These damn doctors don't know what they're doing anymore. You go in there and you tell them what's wrong and they give you all these pills that makes you worse. They just don't know what they're doing. It's a damn shame. Pay all this money and they can't even help you get well, you know. So that's it. That whole system a bunch of crap. And sooner or later it's going to show up at work. You know, I heard a guy say once, if you got a, an addiction, sooner or later it's going to show up at your work. I don't care if you pump gas or if you're a neurosurgeon. It's going to show up at your work. And if you're doing, working with a neurologist, you don't want to bring it with him. But that's out there. That's just how it works. And here again, when that happens, that's easy enough. You know, it's just, it's that boss of mine. He don't understand me. He's been out to get me. You know, I had a job one time. You won't believe this, but I was uh, working as assistant manager in a drugstore. And I, uh, and I had to be there like on Saturday morning, they'd open at 8.30, 9 o'clock. I had to be there. And I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Because there was some Saturday mornings I shouldn't even been alive, much less getting to work at 8.30 in the morning. So I'd show up about 10, 10.30 or 11. Then I'd be tired. So I'd have to rest a half hour, an hour or so. Then I'd come out. And then it was lunchtime. So I'd go to lunch, come back about 2 or 3 in the afternoon. And then had to rest a little bit more. So I rested another hour or so. And then I'd come out and work a half hour. And then it was time to go home. You know, they fired me. You believe that? You know why? Because that manager was jealous. He knew that I knew more than he did. I helped set that store up, and he was just looking for a reason to get rid of me. So that's it. That's what happened. And I heard a guy say once, every time you get a good job and things start going well, some craphead shows up and mess it up for you. So, And when you start thinking like that and you build that wall, all of a sudden reality ain't a problem no more. It just goes away. It's magical. But the problem is you don't, you don't see, you never connect what's wrong with what's going on out here. And pretty soon, reality don't go away, it gets worse and worse. And as it expands, you go into construction building, you build that wall all the way around you. And eventually what you see in here is where the, uh, where the denial has moved into delusion. And when I call this the addictive behavior prison, when I get in here, I don't know what reality is. And what's nifty about this is I can create my own reality. Because now when something happens, I come up with a reason to explain it. It comes out, hits that wall, comes back to me, and that's my reality. Most addicts die right here, not even knowing there's anything wrong. And that's, that's you know, it's an awful thing. And it's, what makes it even worse is the worse reality gets, the thicker you can make those walls. And the more creative we get at surviving that reality. And this is the ism. And then the people around us start getting pulled into it. This is the family. They see what's happening to the addict. And what do you see when you see somebody you care about hurting themselves? What's your first response to that? Try to help them. Try to help them. And you try to protect them. And the way we do that is we buy into their excuse or make excuses for them. Or we, we'll drop them around so they don't get those OWIs. Or we'll go talk to the boss and we'll do all these things to, to try to help the person change. And, and all that does is make it easy for Al to keep doing what he's doing. It reinforces, it helps him avoid reality. And for him to get well, that reality's got to break down that wall so he can see it and motivate him. And once he sees it and realizes it, he'll want to do something to deal with it. But, uh, and the problem with trying to protect him is it's going to get worse because you can't. Eventually it gets worse. And so, and there's another thing too, if I try to protect you and you get well, how am I going to feel? I'm going to feel really good. What about if I try to protect you and get you get worse? How am I going to feel? I'm going to start to feel responsible. And with that responsibility comes an obligation. So now I need for you to be okay in order for me to be okay. So then I start trying to control you. And the way I do that is I'll make deals. I'll have heart-to-heart -heart with you. 
Next time one of your family members gets diarrhea, try to talk them out of crap in their pants. <laughs> try to make a deal with them on it. I'm sorry, but try to make it obvious. Right. <laughs> Bring these Baptists in here. You see what happens, right? There goes, there goes the neighborhood, right? There we go. And here again, so I try to control you. And that's the catch. I'll be talking about this in a couple of weeks when we talk about family. The paradox is control is the more I try to control you, the more you control me. Because now your behavior determines mine. And now whether you're getting well or not determines whether I feel like a success or a failure. And so then when you keep slipping back, and plus when I try to control you, it validates and reinforces what a failure you are. It's really a form of judgment. Let me see here. Look at this. Now you better put that away. I don't want you to drop it and lose it, okay? See this glass that got water in it? I don't, you might want to set it back. I want you to spill it all over Perry's carpet here. What else we got here? And is that your phone? <laughs> now you don't want to leave that, okay? Or your hand out there. And there's that big glass of water. You really gonna make a mess over there. And here's another one. I don't know. And, uh, what's that? That's, your, that's a spoon. You're going to, don't be stealing the spoons now. Be sure you put that back. Okay. Is that your, that your purse there? Okay, now I want you to make sure you don't forget that. Now, when I start doing all that, what, how does that feel? Annoying. Annoying, of course. Because if I'm telling you all that stuff, what's that say about what I think of you? That you don't know what you're doing. And you can't do it for yourself. And we're talking about somebody who's hypersensitive, and that's exactly how they're going to hear it. And eventually they're going to resent it, and they're going to start putting it back on you, and they're going to blame you. And they're going to invite you to do it, and then turn around and blame you for it. And over time, that builds up resentment. So you're going to start blaming them, and then you get the shame and blame on both sides. And both of you have to build up your own walls to survive that. And then at that point, you become a part of the problem instead of part of the solution. And if you don't know how not to do that, it's just kind of automatic. And so we've got the addict on the one side and what I call the co-addict or codependent on the other. And recovery can start on either side of that. Can, can I back you up a little bit? Sure you can. Really fast. Oh, okay, all right. Well, <laughs> get me going, right? <laughs> So I'm Polish and I'm slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I'm I'm driven Scotch, so I'm crazy. So, <laughs> you, go, right. you said uh, you said something about uh, you could see the wall getting up, and then you said it's uh, like I can't remember a word you said, but something like it's obvious or the solution or like you went right over the answer. I didn't get the answer. What's the obvious answer? Uh, the wall. What do you mean, the to, wall? To get out of this cycle. Like, what's the obvious answer? I felt like you just said it. It, it takes two to tangle, mm -hmm. and recovery can start on either side of this. And if I see you with a problem, and it's and I'm be I'm part of it, then the place beginning dealing with it is not what's going on with you, but what's going on with me. And I'm gonna spend a whole class on that, and what that's about, and the roles, and how to start to break out of those. I use the example of being a lifeguard. If you want to be a lifeguard and keep people from drowning, where does that process start? Yeah. With my swimming lessons. I'm not going to help you by drowning with you, but I can't swim for you either. But I can do my own swimming and demonstrate there's an option to drowning. And when and if you're interested in getting some swimming lessons, now I can be a resource. In the meantime, I ain't going to drown. And they even tell you that when you take swimming lessons. And they say if you try to rescue somebody and they start pulling you down, what do you do? You let them go and you <laughs> save yourself, right? And, that's, and this is hard because this isn't somebody off the street. This is somebody that you really care about. And you can see it and they can't. And it's frustrating as heck. But what you can do is don't tell me, show me, is demonstrate it. And then if they see you doing the work, now you got some credibility. And if you keep pointing out to them, hey, what are you going to do about that? 
I really care about you. Do the care frontations I've talked about. And I hate to see this happen, but you know, that's not my call. When you're ready to, for me to help you, I'm going to be here. And if, and if there's no defense against love. And so if you do it in a caring, concerned way, they're more likely to hear it. And if you keep coming back to it, even slow Polish can, can learn. So can Baptists. <laughs> exactly. Do you think they always see that? Big pardon? Do you think they always see that? See what? Well, that you're trying to help or no. see really what you're doing. In fact, there's a good chance they're going to react and try to sabotage it. Right. Like I was going to say, I guess the reason why I said that is because I think a lot of times there's just negativity that comes out of it. You know, you're trying to do what's right. But yeah. The, yeah. I don't see that at all. Well, they can't. It's not, don't they? Can't. Plus, you're threatening. You got to understand what Al's doing here is he's not doing what he wants to do. He's doing what he has to do. This is his survival mechanism, and he sees that as a threat to what to his reality. But you got to understand his reality is part of the delusion, and so you have to. Hang in there and keep pointing it out. I've heard everything you've said, but mm. how are you supposed to know what's right or wrong to do that? I mean, I'm not mm. wording that very good. Well, no. Well, I hear you, and you don't. So it's trial and error. So what you do know is <coughs> that if whatever I do to support it and enable it's not a good thing. So I need to do. I need to get my act together so I'm part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. And that, how like do you I know? I know I'm, how do you know what's right and what's wrong? By what's best for you. Yeah. No, and if you're doing everything you can do and it still doesn't happen, you have, all you can do is do say, I did the best I could do. Yeah, that's, you have to let go. Wise man told me once early on that a lot of the really important questions don't have answers. And so I have to deal with things sometimes without the answer. And I think the best way to know how to deal with it is to come from what I know about what's going on and, and taking care of myself and, and understanding what that person's dealing with so I'm in a better position to help that person when and if it comes around. Because it's hard to deal with something you can't see and don't know anything about. So that's the first step. Well, here again, basically what he says is, if you'll drop in the water and drown with me, we can talk. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure. And, and even if you'd have said, well, look, I'll go and I'll just watch you drown a little bit. Yeah. But, and, um, but I won't do anything to try to get you out of the water. Even that, that would have been enabling, and I'm not sure that had been helpful either. So he helped me. <laughs> so I think, you know, you, you made a good choice to take care of yourself. And I and give yourself some credit for that. And you helped your son too. It doesn't feel like it. He doesn't need any help self-destructing. Mm -hmm. And so you can do things to facilitate his self-destruction or to take care of yourself. The more you do to take care of yourself, the better that's going to be for him long term. And that's something you can do something about. Right. And right. that's how you help him yeah. by not making it easy for right. continue right. to kill himself. Because a lot of times you thought, well, if I do this, I can keep peace in the family. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's the wrong thinking, mm -hmm. but I'm just being honest I've done yeah. that because I don't want to, probably because I haven't wanted to deal with it. I don't know. You know? Well, it's hard. It wears you down. And then talk about that no win. That's what families can get into, too. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at what you can do and make that enough. It doesn't feel like it a lot of times, but it is. Well, you so can't do more than you can do. Yeah, I'll, I'll a non-loss is a win. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, the the thing, you know, there's uh, three C's in recovery. You, they, you didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. But you, that doesn't mean you can't do anything. You can do some things to make it harder for him to keep doing what he's doing. And that's what you focus on. And that doesn't start with him, that starts with you. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. 
but that doesn't mean you can't do anything. So your challenge is start to look at what I can do. And you're not going to find that focusing on trying to fix him or what's going on with him. You're going to find that from here. And so yeah, that's where you have to look. What's it got to even, do with that me? That could even mean that you totally withdraw from the situation. Yeah. Sometimes that's necessary. Yeah. And, and you might need some help for that. I mean, that's out there for you, because it's damn hard. In a later... Can you talk a little bit more about the family and then the changes, like the internal changes that we make, and then how does that affect our family system versus the, our... Okay. I can, but I'll be repeating it in a couple oh, weeks. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but it, maybe, it's, maybe it's worth repeating. I'll do it anyway, what the heck. <laughs> Because it was helpful to me growing up with crazy, you know, and being crazy along with it didn't help. So for my own family's sake, you know, and the best thing I've ever done for my family was some work on this guy. And that's still time and a half on a good day, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but here again, yeah, when you think a family is a system, best way to visualize it is like a mobile. Now, mobile is a system, and for it to function, it has to stay in balance. And what happens when there's a problem, like, you come, like somebody comes along and slapped one of the characters in the mobile. And so all the other characters in mobile have to adjust to bring that balance back. And as long as they're doing all the adjusting, the, the other person doesn't have to change. Now, if you guys stop and start getting well, that's going to have the same effect going to knock it out of balance, except this time the person you're concerned about is going to have to adjust. If they're not likely to pat you on the back for it, in a couple of weeks we'll talk about what some of those reactions are and, and how that works. But that system will organize around the healthiest or the unhealthiest person in it. And all it takes is one person to readjust the system. As a workshop years ago, my back, my mass in education for working with schools and families in schools and stuff. And the point they made was if you got a family with kids that are really crazy, pick the one kid that's the healthiest and work with that kid to get well. And that can, that can change the whole system. You know, I was at a speaker's meeting one night and I heard this guy saying he's recovering about how his family helped bring him back from his from his alcoholism. He said, you know, I like this metaphor. He said, you know, the trunk went crazy and the branches brought it back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you guys be the branches, okay? Yeah. And that's something you've got something to say about. And if you do that and it don't work, all you can do is say, do what you got to do to deal with it and say it couldn't work. Cause it's like, I'm a southern boy, and up here in winter, if you put, on a really cold day, if you put all the clothes you got on to stay warm, and you walk out and you're still cold, you're going to be cold. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, you can't do more than you can to make something change, you know. So then you do what you got to do to deal with it. And that might not be what you want to hear, but that's what it is, okay? But there's always things you can do to take care of yourself in spite of it. So that's what you focus on. And I've found that helpful in my own experience. And not only for you but, and your kids, but for on down the road. This stuff's multi-generational. And who's next in line for this stuff? Your grandkids. I heard a guy say once that any of the anger and stuff you don't deal with will show up in your grandkids. And I said, hey, that's, a, that's unacceptable. So I'm going to do the work to break the cycle. And anybody can do that. And when I look in my family, it goes back as far as I can see. My parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. And, and I said, well, you know, let's stop the machine. And I feel fortunate that my kids have done pretty well. I mean, they got their issues. But in my grandkids, I look at my son, he's an amazing father in the grandkids. And, and I'd like to think that maybe some of the work I did had something to do with that. Sure as hell didn't hurt. 
his father just kept drinking and fighting, I don't think that would have happened, you know, but it's what it is. And that's, and that's something, I ain't going to take the credit, but I can feel better about it. Maybe that's, there's worse reasons to do something, is what I'm saying. So, so I don't know. It, it's, it's really hard, but, and, and having resources to support you make it easy. Or not make it easy, it makes it, makes it easier. I don't think it ever gets automatic, but it does get easier as you start to understand it and get resources to help you do it. And it, when you first start, you don't have a clue. But that don't mean you can't get one. <laughs> so that's, that's my whole point. And so, and remember, you're dealing with your own con right. deformed, for lack of a better term, reality. Because you had to get a little crazy to make sense out of the other person's craziness. And two crazies don't help anybody. <laughs> I've kidded with my kids uh -huh. and told them the way to break the cycle is make sure you never make me a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that cheats you too, though. <laughs> I understand. When well, you look at the genetic, you know, well, I understand. The genetic from I understand. Yeah. But what we're starting to understand, and I've done a lot of research on genetics and and that kind of stuff, and uh, is that uh, the environment is probably as significant as genetic. In fact, environment can change gene can change gene expression. And that's something I think we can do something about. So that's, here again, I focus on what I can do. And that's serenity prayer, you know. That's some very wise, that's a very wise statement. <laughs> and the, that last part, the wisdom know the difference where it gets tricky sometimes. <laughs> At least for me. Earlier so, in the week yeah. we talked about the locus of control. Yeah. Can you go give me a... Well, sure. Okay. And that's a household term, right? Locus of control. Well, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And, and one of the things you see with addicts and families is they have an external locus of control. And locus of control is where your life's controlled from. And so their locus of control is out here on the person they're concerned about or everything that's going around them. So they always, they, they always live their life, not always, but they tend to live their lives from the outside in. I happen to believe, and what we know, the research shows us is that people with an external locus of control don't do so well. You see a lot of those people in prison and with a lot of addictive issues and mental health problems. And that people with an internal locus of control, that is, I call that living your life from the inside out tend to do better. They tend to be a little more successful and, and are able to deal with things better. And so that's, that's a real challenge to get where I control my life from, from here instead of from out there. And that's what I think recovery is. And here again, one of the first things, I'll, I'll get into this some more with Al. Remember what kind of person we started with? And remember what he ended up looking like? What did I lose along the way? His true self. He lost who he is as a person. And what recovery, I define recovery as finding something that has been lost. So his challenge is not just to stop drinking or using. His real challenge is to recover who he is and make that the basis for how he lives his life. And, when, and that's what you see in recovery. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh. Uh, you were talking about how they started out and then what they became. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking how they started out um, may be a product of maybe an over too high of expectations on a person, too much discipline, mm -hmm. that yeah. they're super sensitive and have to be perfectionists and mm -hmm. maybe... Uh, Real religious environment or something? Well, yeah, you know, I grew up Southern Baptist, and my parents were pretty, pretty fundamentalist, and uh, and I re, you know, I re, you know, I kind of, I kind of rebelled against that. I was telling Perry, showing up drunk at the church softball games didn't endear me to the, 
congregation or the pastor. My dad was the manager of the team, you know, and uh, and it wasn't so much what they said as what I did with it. I kind of got a God's going to get you mentality, which I have come to redefine God around somebody who cares about me and suffers with me, and I don't see him that way. And when I first started recovering, I'd have said, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. It, neither the twain shall meet. And now I would say my concept of spirituality is kind of a hybrid sum of both. You know, and, and so I take from scripture and religion, there's a lot of wisdom there that I find helpful and that validate what, what I see as helpful in terms of my perception of God. I'll go, although the head of the Southern Baptist Convention said, no, you can't take what you can use. It's all or nothing. That's why we didn't get along very well. But I don't agree with that. So, you know, I don't see God as all or nothing. I see him as gray, you know, as, diver as a gray, a diversity, uh, 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 all of the above, a lot of different things. But that's just been helpful to me. And that's, everybody, I think, needs to find that for themselves. Anyway, what I didn't say earlier is that whole characterological conflict is you've got this, his addict self and his true, true self always going at it to see who's going to run the show. And somewhere along the way, he needs to reconcile his true self with his addict self. So that it's not either or, it's all the above. He needs to, I don't think it's a matter of choosing my attic or me. I think it's all the above. Because my attic self bought me time till I could figure out who I was and survive. You know, without that attic, I'd have probably self-destructed or went crazy. But what you got to do to survive can kill you too. It's the best way I ever heard it put. I was at a workshop years ago on shame. And a, the, the guy, I think it was, was his name was? Uh, Fisher, his name, Bruce Fisher. He was saying, this is what a whole person looks like. By the way, that's where the word holy comes from, being a whole person. And he said, and what shame, and I thought, an addiction does to us is this. It splits who we are right down the middle. And in my experience, there's that part of me that's my attic piece, and then there's that who I really am piece. And so the challenge for me is not just to get rid of the attic piece, but this, is to reconcile that wounded part of me with who I am so that, so that they become a resource for me in my own life. And having some help with that, I have to believe that the 12 steps are one of the best outlines for that process I've seen. Because the 12th step doesn't, you know, the 12 steps doesn't say anything about abstinence or sobriety. It doesn't even mention that. It only used the word alcohol, and that's in the first step. And that's true of any other addictions, whether it's sex addicts or GA or NA or whatever. It only mentions the symptom in the first step. It says the result of these steps is a spiritual awakening. John Bradshaw always said, Spirituality is about having inner life, being able to be in me. And when I'm an addict or I've been wounded and have a lot of shame, it, that's not, I can't go in me. So everything's an outer reach for inner security. That's what codependency and addiction is. And that's what an external locus of control is. So until I can reconcile some of that stuff, then I'm going to have to keep running from myself. I had a guy call me this week. He had called me a year ago, and I know he's, had, he's got a problem with alcohol because his sisters have called me a couple of times to try to get me to help him out. And I've said, well, let's meet for coffee, and I'll, I'll talk. And, he, and a year ago, he didn't make it, so he called me again last week, and he said, you know, I really need help. I said, well, let's, let's sit down and talk about it. I'm not doing clinical work, but it doesn't mean I can't, we can't talk and we can't try to help you take a look at some of this stuff. So, and I hope he makes it. But, and what, what if he doesn't, next he'll call again and I'll say, you know, you just can't keep running from yourself. Sooner or later you're going to have to stop and face it. And I don't know if you ever thought about that. If you're walking down a dark street and somebody's following you, 
and you walk faster and they start walking faster, what's going to happen? You're going to have to keep walking. And the faster you walk and the faster they walk, the harder it is to stop and turn around and face whatever it is that you're trying to avoid. And it doesn't matter whether it's somebody following you or whether it's you. And the sooner you can do that and having people to help you with that, I don't think is, is a bad idea at all. Safe people, we talked about that, in a safe place. Well, you can be honest and get it out without worrying about being shamed or judged or hurt. And uh, it don't have to be a group, just one person who's safe that you can be really honest with, who will validate you for who you are and not what's happened to you or how you've acted. And addicts need that. It's harder for them because we confuse who they are with what they're doing. And so do they. And so we need to keep bringing them back to who you are, you know, and I've done that. So, you know, when I see you acting like that, I really get concerned because I really don't think that's what you're about. And I really get concerned when I see you hurting yourself like that. And, and if I'd really like to see you do something about that. And, you, and then you leave it, <laughs> plant a seed or two, and see where it goes. And you haven't lost anything, but now they know you know. And that makes you a resource. Because mm -hmm. they, they can play this outside here all day long. They know how to manipulate, play that game up one side and down the other. And it's not very helpful. So I would encourage you not to play that game. It's hard because, like I say, they know how to suck that in and bite that. But it takes two to tangle. And one of my business partners <laughs> always said, Smart fish don't bite. <laughs> and so that's another way of looking at it. They can bait you, but I would encourage you not to bite. And to keep going back to who they are and how that's, they don't deserve to be treated that way by themselves or anybody else. And when they're, when they're ready to get do something about it, that's where I come in. I can't do it for you. And even if I could, I wouldn't, because that's that saying you can't, that's disrespectful as hell. Because I re, and I'll tell people, I respect you too much to do that for you. But I'm willing to try to help you find somebody that can help you do it for yourself. And that starts with me. I can't give you what I ain't got. And that's, that's a, that's a no-brainer, but it's true. And I've tried that one both ways, by the way. I don't know. See, I think this is the last slide. It's the last one. Okay, so any questions? Next week I'm going to do a second part that looks at cultural and attitudes and other things that are going on that keeps a person from seeing it. And us too to some extent. Because this doesn't exist in a vacuum. When you live around it, it kind of, in fact, there's a great line from... Uh, there was a group another year, number of years ago for adult children called TOVA. And that's to, they're not around anymore, and they were an excellent support group. And that stood for the other victims of alcoholism. And they had this domino thing that the glove was alcohol. And in each domino was like different people in life, you know, bosses, family, friends, churches, whoever. And once it starts, it takes everybody. And their logo was, alcoholism is not contagious, but its effects are. And so that's what i got to look at. Right? And that's true of whatever the addiction is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm on the sheet here that says the brain hates anxiety. And so the, um, the behavior and um, unmanageable life triggers increasing anxiety in the brain. And brain needs to make sense out of it. You know, we are meaning makers. If we can't make sense out of something, it drives us crazy. And that's where all this is about, trying to make sense out of it. And so your uh, right hemisphere, that's your feeling brain, looks to your left hemisphere, that's your rational brain, try to make sense out of it. And they, ha and they rely on cognitive operators to help us do that. And that's on the next page here. 
And one of the operators we all use these is the causal operator. That's where we look at situation and come up with causes to try to explain it. Well, the reason this happened is because of this. And, and I went through some of that with the defenses. And that helped us make sense out of it. Another one addicts like to use, we all use, is the binary operator. That's where you put everything in extreme, black and white, all or nothing, this or that. And it gives you, and what that does is gives you some illusion of understanding, gives you an illusion of control, an illusion of power. But think about it. Look at this. I don't have two of them. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I brought them with me. Thank you. In the whole world, there are only two pens that are really worth having or using. Got them right here. Look. <laughs> you believe that? Two. I got them right here. Now, what did I do? Just do with my knowledge of pens? <laughs> just cornered the market. <laughs> And what's the problem with that kind of thinking? What am I missing? Everything else. <laughs> Most of the pins in the world, you see. But if I really believe that, all of a sudden I feel really like I know what's going on and like I have some sense of security and empowerment and all kinds of things. But what I miss is most of what everything else is around me. Because you see, Recovery and the kinds of stuff we're talking about is not a black and white, it's a gray. And what's the problem with gray? It, control. Yeah, the problem with gray is it's not very definitive. There's all kinds of things I don't know in a gray area. So that can cause a lot of anxiety. So when I narrow it down to this or that, it takes away that anxiety and makes me feel like, hey, See, I know. And you'll see that rigidity, that all or nothing, black and white. And that's part of that whole survivor thing in terms of trying, I call it taking the power back when they feel powerless and anxious and make, it, make them believe that they know something, that they, they've, got it, they've got it nailed down. But what they're really doing is sabotaging themselves. And so you see that binary operator coming out a lot of times. And we all do that to some extent, especially when we get anxious or, or afraid, you see? Okay, and the next one here is emotional value operator. Now that's where I, I put, tap into my feelings. Good chance the amygdala is part of that. That's the part of our limbic system that, that produce feelings. And that emotional thing gives me a little push you know, I'm really serious this time, damn it. I'm pissed off. I'm going to do it this time, right? And that gives me a little push and makes me think I can do something I can't do. But it, it, re, it helps me feel less anxious and, and reinforces that, you know, I'm serious about it. So that operator can help us, you know. How many of you used that one for losing weight or exercise or something? You buy I've used a number of times. <laughs> <laughs> and this last one here is the ex existential operator. That's a part of my brain, and that, that, gener that originates in the limbic system, probably the amygdala or the uh, hippocampus or hypothalamus. And that's that part of me that gives me some sense of a power greater than me, something outside of me that I can turn to for help and a kind of bigger authority, God, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and that's one I can use too, you know, I'll just, I kind of heard that from you a minute ago. <laughs> right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get God to help us, and he will. But you got to do some of the work. I remember a priest told me once, he said, if God could do anything he wanted to. And he said, I've always wanted to be a doctor. And he said, I'm convinced that God could, could make me a doctor right now if he wanted to. He said, I just don't think he would. God would say, you want to be a doctor? Go to medical school. <laughs> 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 and it's the same with it. God says, you want your son to be better? 
do what you need to do to help the process. And here again, with the binary, that illusion of understanding, empowerment, and control, it will ultimately create more anxiety because it misses the gray. You see, and so I'm going to end up in a worse place. So, I mean, it will be more conflicts and stuff, right? Exactly, and more uncertainty, because all of a sudden I realize maybe I don't know everything. Maybe there are other pins in the world, you know? <laughs> And that's going to that's going to freak. That's going to create more anxiety. See what I'm saying? And emotional value too. That creates more left and right side conflict. Cause I can't, I can't here again piss myself off out of an addiction or something. You see, or motivate myself enough to do what I have to do, just from an emotional kind of a belief that's probably not real. It's just something I made up mm -hmm. and so ultimately that creates more anxiety and can you keep seeing the catch-22 everything I'm doing to try to make it better keeps making it worse our right brain is called our feeling brain that's part of a brain that's more sensitive feelings and things like that our left side our left temporal lobe or our left uh, brain is more rational about facts and understand what's going on and so in this situation a brain says it's the experiential feeling type thing so it looks over to the right and says all right you give me some of that <coughs> cognitive stuff some of that uh, tangible stuff you know to help me understand this and it it doesn't it doesn't have the, no the knowledge to explain this but you know it's it's just how our brains work, how we have to try to make sense out of it. And then those cognitive operators reinforce my denial and make it worse long term. But it's, it's, that's all survival stuff. See, I don't sit down and think that's what I'm doing. It just happens, you know. It's, uh, it just has to happen. Because our brain any, is built to help us survive. And it will hang on to and retain anything that's survival enhancing. And so anything that's survival enhancing, my brain will remember and use. The other thing is our brain learns through repetition. The more I do something, the better I get at it, the more I know about it. And so the more Al reinforces his blindness and denial, the harder it's going to be for him to not do it because the brain's going to learn that's how it is. Good example if you've got a hearing loss and you don't notice it, you don't hear certain words. If you, um, if you don't do something about it, eventually your brain forgets what that word is and so you won't be able to hear it, period. It's just gone because that's how our brains work. So, you know, and it's the other side. If I start reinforcing recovery things and, and who I am, my, my brain will remember that. And once they see that survival enhancing, then it'll hang on to it and reinforce it. And, and that's real obvious when you see people in recovery. They've got a whole different gear going up there now, and it's working for them. Yeah, that's, I think so. Good point. I think there's a lot of hope comes out of that one. And you notice that's one of the last ones we go to. When, there, when all else fails, God help me, right? Yeah. And the good news is he will. And one of the pieces, I've been doing a lot of reading with a guy named Richard Rohr, and I really like what he has to say because he's not real traditional, but he's very knowledgeable. He's an expert on the gospel and the Bible and different things and talks about the whole idea of uh, God as a suffering God, and God suffers with us. And so, and he would say only a suffering God could save. And when I get into the family stuff, I'm going to point out some aspects of that that reinforce that concept, I think. And so, uh, and so the hope comes from understanding that God's not going anywhere. You know, I've abandoned and betrayed myself, but he's been hanging in there with me the whole time. And that's kind of good to know. <laughs> yeah, really, right. And, and I think recovery really reiterates that and reinforces that for you. 
And the hope comes from what you can do and know what you can do. And addicts are people, and codependents too, who've been swimming a river with a bowling ball in their hand. It's kind of hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> wrong. Yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> and, and, and this is a sign of Smalley thing. And when they start to drown, uh, when, and when they let go of the ball, they say, won't you let go of the ball? And they'll say, well, it's the only one I'll ever have. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, you know, they don't know how to let it go, and they can't hang on to it. It just keeps coming back to that Catch-22 stuff. So this whole thing is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. But when you think about it, that's what any disease is. If I start sneezing, snotting, getting a scratchy throat, good chance I'm getting a cold. And that's a normal reaction to that cold virus. And it's the same with, uh, with heart disease, chest pains, or high blood pressure, or diabetes with your blood sugars up. That's a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. And, and addiction and codependency, same thing. It's just not that tangible. Well, I like the term people addiction. Okay. Yeah. So I see it just people yeah. addiction. And it meets the criteria for addiction and a disease in yeah. terms of what's required. The original term for, uh, for codependency was uh, para-alcoholic. And I thought that meant two alcoholics, right? <laughs> in some sense, yeah. Well, in some sense it does. It's just that one of them's not drinking, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like the idea that I think that that co-addiction or codependency was our first addiction that we learned that very young in our family and that a lot of these other addictions are, are kind of branch off from that well Bradshaw caused codependency the disease of the disease and I thought that's a nice way of looking at it and I think it might be true and then once I get sober I've got that piece to deal with <laughs> mm -hmm. so where's the good news come? <laughs> <laughs> good news comes is I can deal with it. Yeah. And what I've learned to help me get sober can help me deal with that addiction too. And that's part of taking me back because codependency is a disease lost lost selfhood as is um, as is any other addiction. I like here again Sandra Smalley's definition is very simple. Codependency is losing the me in we. And I think for an addict, it's losing the me in the, whatever the addiction is. And so that's what I have to define that and, and recover it. I heard a person say once that everything your grandparents were, your parents were, and everything they were, you are. And so it's important to know something about my parents and my, my grandparents and my family. And it's important to know something about me and who I am. Most people know a lot more about sports figures and certain athletes and movie stars and stuff than they do themselves. I was told early on that everybody ought to know their own story. And I think that's important. And I like, I like the outline they use in 12 Steps. What it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Where did I, how did I lose myself? I routinely ask my client, where did you learn to hate yourself so much? I think I mentioned that one before. Because that's what happens. I heard there's a really excellent presenter who, 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 work, who does a lot of work with abused and adult children who says that addicts are people who have grown up to despise themselves. And that's the real problem. And that's not something I can fix for you. I can reinforce that you don't deserve it and uh, throw some love at you. That might help you start to <laughs> learn to care about yourself a little bit. But ultimately, that's an inside job. Yeah. And my bias is now I ought to look different than you know than it was than it than the past. You know. Well, here again, remember what I said: the brain, anything that's survival enhancing the brain will hold on to. And if I grow up and I'm a ball of pain full of shame and confusion and guilt and self-hatred and contempt and, 
and uh, despise myself. Anything that helps me feel better, I'm going to be interested in. <coughs> and so, and so, I'm already, I'm an accident waiting to happen. And then on top of that is that whole hijacked brain theory, that the neurophysiology is more sensitive to that. And when I use it, it's going to make me feel better than it does a normal person. That's a genetic piece, which, is, which reinforce it even more. So yeah, I think for most addicts, their addiction start out as solution, and and become a problem. I grew up with uh, my parents were weren't against drinking. There wasn't any alcoholism with my parents, but my grandfather was pretty much he ended up homeless, pretty much street drunk. He's a beautiful person, but he had this problem. My mom used to shame him and abuse him, let him come to the house and, you know, and wouldn't, and I never understood why she could treat him that way. He seemed like a good guy to me. But that was how she got wounded. You gotta, rem with her, her, my grandmother died when she was like 12 years old and there were, there were 11 of them, I think. And so she needed a mommy and ended up having to become a mommy for all of her other kids. And right after that, my grandfather got into his drink and pretty much became an alcoholic. So she lost both her parents and was very needy and never really got over that. And did pretty well, all things considered, but she just couldn't get what she couldn't have either. And growing up around that and watching her behavior and her her resentments and anger, and she uh, she never really did the grief work yeah. to help yeah. her with that. And, mm -hmm. and I've never been good with that either. That's a tough one. I'm going to spend a whole class on that, and uh, and still still did doesn't you know. And so she had all that unfinished grief stuff going on, and and I couldn't understand what what was wrong. You know, I always thought you know what why she and she was very critical and you know and always complaining about everything and and I've often said hell you know if she was getting drunk all the time at least I'd have knew what the hell was wrong yeah. with her yeah <laughs> as it was I figured I must be crazy and yeah. I didn't I haven't ruled that out yet but uh, <laughs> yeah. but that was it. so if growing up without the symptom can be more just as wounding and it's definitely more confusing a lot of times and it's always, it's not well defined. I know on my mom's side, it was pretty obvious that he was, uh, he was a problem. But it's that side of the family where I get my sensitivity and really empathy for people. And uh, of course, in, you know, for my mom and my grandmother apparently was that way. That, that was a real liability. So it's kind of like when I was in Vietnam. Your sensitivity and empathy and feelings are a liability, so you, you shut them down. And so what I've had to learn is how to be sensitive and care without getting hurt. And that sounds easier than it is. So that's taken some work. And uh, then on my dad's side, he was, my grandfather on that side was very ab abusive verbally and physically to my dad when he was growing up. We never called him an alcoholic. But all the empty bottles down the woods around the barn made me think maybe there was something going on. <laughs> but it was never as obvious with him. I think that was more one of the family's secrets, to, you know. But it's just what it is, you know. And I, I understand why my parents were there. And my dad, he way, the way he dealt with things is he, he just tried to stay out of the line of fire, you know. He just kind of withdrew and placated and mm -hmm. put up with things, you know. That don't work for me, you know. I'm a badge number kind of guy, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's helped me understand what was going on with them. And but I still, even though I understand they had those problems, I still gotta deal with how that affected me as a kid and, and different times in my life. And so a lot of shaming and blaming and different things. So yeah. So that's the deal, you know. Somebody comes in with a baseball bat, and hits you upside the head, and you understand that they they have a mental health issue. You still got to deal with the baseball bat upside the head. Yeah. See what I'm saying? And so, I mean, it it 
you don't have to blame them, but you still got to understand how it affected you and do the work to, to heal that. And that's, that's not uncommon for kids who grew up, I would call it a war zone. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to growing up in a, being in a war. In fact, I had a, found an article from a friend of mine. He's a Native American from Red Cliff. He was a student of mine at Mount Scenario a lot of years ago. If you remember that school, that would date you, right? right? But, yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, he wrote a, a paper called uh, um, Vietnam, A Basis for Codependency, which was very interesting. He was a, a Nam vet. And some of the stuff he read sounded real familiar. I know where he got those crazy ideas from, but it was well done. But like I say, he was, he's passed away and grew up with a, you know, alcoholic father and was recovering himself. So he had some good information, some, done some good work on that. So, so that's the key, is not what happened, but what I do about it, how I'm going to deal with it. And if I don't know, that's a good place to start. But yeah. Any other questions? Hmm. Boy, damn, I'm good. I guess. <laughs> 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 oh, I, uh, thank you. <laughs>